Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 18 of We Are Trans Presents Trans Talks. Uh, I'm your host, Sammy James, and I am excited to have another wonderful guest. Please welcome the wonderful singer-songwriter, Mia Byrne. How are you doing, Mia? I'm good. Um, just uh, trying to get my bearings today. It was yeah. a cold night, so I, I didn't sleep very warmly, okay. <laughs> which always messes me up. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, first thing I ask is for my guests to introduce themselves a little bit. Um, I ask specifically what words do you use to describe yourself, uh, but anything else you'd like to uh, tell people um, about you, your career, uh, and anything else you want to tell them, you, you are welcome to do that up top. All right, great. Um, well, hello, my name is Mia Byrne. I'm a non-binary trans woman originally from New York, currently living in San Francisco. And I do live in San Francisco, the city, which is a little strange. Uh, I live in a, in a very gay male neighborhood. I live in the Castro, which is very odd. <laughs> and I'm just trying to navigate through that a lot of the time. Um, I formerly lived in Berkeley uh, in a house full of trans people next to another house full of trans people. So it's very odd sometimes to sometimes feel like the only trans woman in the room or in the area, which is not always true. I, I do have a housemate who's trans and, and uh, I am I'm an AA, uh, which is a big part of my life right now. Um, being in recovery is a very cool thing and super fun. Um, and I'm really lucky to... Um, no trans folks in in the bay through that um uh about me uh words three words right three words? it's any, any amount of words it's um, if you if you want to pick three go for it but <laughs> i'm a sweetheart i i'm a homemaker and that goes a long way and um uh and a bit of a wacky pants. That works. Wacky pants. I like I a fellow wacky pants. <laughs> it's really it's a, fun. Uh, uh, I, yeah. Hey, um, there's there's two of us. This who knows? Maybe this interview will get a little wacky pants. Yes, I'm a full time artist. I'm a singer songwriter. I do poetry. I make film, uh, and uh, that's it's a lot. It's a lot. I perform a lot. Um, and uh it's it's what i do it's my life so uh how, how did you get into music if you can pinpoint uh an, an answer to that you know it seems like i was always into music from a very young age okay. uh, you know i remember being like two years old and like strumming on a tennis racket to pretend i was playing guitar and making up songs uh I would make up songs a lot on my walk home once I started walking home when I was a latchkey kid. Um, and uh, I got a guitar when I was 10. I'd, I'd been asking and asking and asking and finally I got one. Uh, I'm very lucky that my parents were able to provide that. But before that I built, and it's funny because I just did it on my own. Like I had weird, there was a bunch of wire and, and wood in the basement of my house. So like I kind of built like a fake guitar <laughs> that just went twangy, twangy, twang. And then I found out years later that a lot of folks who grew up in the era before guitars were relatively affordable um like uh they and and then there, there's just this tradition of folks in especially in the rural south but um mm -hmm. uh making making guitars that way and the most famous thing is called the diddly bow which is uh was pretty ubiquitous um and it comes from like i think some yoruba instruments okay um but like so a lot of like uh black blues men uh that's kind of how they started they would like take a nail and put some wire in it put a nail on the other side and like make a thing that went twing 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 and that's kind of a, a tradition and i just kind of tapped into that like with without thinking about it it was pretty cool yeah um yeah and so um 
I always I can remember just being a child and like having like, you know, just listening to Madonna and like, you know, doing all this stuff and like wanting to be a rock and roller my whole life. It just has always been. And so I was lucky my parents always had music around. They're not musicians, but they had vinyl and all sorts of stuff around. And so it was a very cool and wonderful thing to be able to just sort of be in an environment that was positive about music, uh, even though it was very hard and um, for me to learn because I have attention deficit disorder. And um, uh, it's it was very difficult for me to learn. But once I started uh, playing music, it became much easier. So yeah, and then I was 17 and I started working in recording studios. And by the time I was 22, 24, I was like really doing music full time. It was just became my vocation. And of course I have done and still do some other things uh, to pay bills on occasion, but I'm really lucky that I've stuck with music and it has uh, fed me, which is really cool. Yeah. Who, who would you say are some of your musical uh, influences? Uh, Cookie Monster. Kermit the Frog. Uh, uh, John Why are Pond. there so many songs about rainbows? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like Joe Raposo, definitely uh, the, the writer for Sesame Street, had a huge influence on uh, on me, as he did on a lot of people. I mean, his song craft is really, really great. And because of um, Jim Henson, you know, I was introduced to so many different artists. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, and, Disney and all this stuff, you know, in my younger early days. Um, and then I was really influenced. I'm really influenced by like people like Howlin' Wolf and um, John Prine and Nina Simone and without being appropriative of, of their stuff. And like, you know, that's not where I'm at. I just like when you're talking about people who influence me in terms of how I write songs and things like that. Um it's really a, a combination of like really strong electric Chicago blues influence mm-hmm. um, and uh, Memphis soul influence like Steve Cropper and Otis Redding and uh, guys like that. And Steve Cropper is a huge influence on my guitar style as well. He's not a flashy guitarist. He just kind of like does his thing. Um, the Grateful Dead, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Joni Mitchell, um, let me think of some others. Um, there's so there's just so many folks who've like really highly influenced me. Like when I was much younger, I listened to Buffy St. Marie a lot. Um, um, and uh, in now it's, I'm really, I'm really dig Lily Hyde is one of my favorite new contem- well, contemporary artists. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Lucinda Williams. Um, yeah, really great stuff there. Um, just a lot of uh, Nashville, Texas, Americana music. And it, it really depends on what I'm into at the particular time. But yeah, I find I find myself getting into different things at different times. Okay. Um, so would you have a favorite song to play and sing uh, that you did not write? Uh, a, fa- um, a, fa- yeah. a favorite song to cover? Yeah, Chris Christopherson's uh, Help Me Make It Through the Night is one of my favorites. Nice. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, how how has I, I actually haven't asked this on the the show. It's been it's been like maybe too soon the whole time, but like how how has your uh, career been with with everything that's going on as you know has has it been a, a shift to virtual ha, have you maintained some in-person shows is it is it uh, more one or the other just what what is the current landscape of of the shows you're doing what's been difficult for me is that um i'm currently living in a place uh here in san francisco a lot of venues closed and a lot of the places that i was playing closed some of them are reopening um but the venues that managed to stay open are very large venues in which i'm trying to get like opening sets and stuff like that um but um the landscape really changed for the kind of music I play here. And it's not that there aren't people who are welcoming to me or stuff like that. It's just that I think here in the Bay, things haven't quite reopened like they have in other parts of the country. So the shows that I have done um, this year have mostly been in Nashville. Um, Yeah, because after I got vaccinated, I I went straight to Nashville. 
Um, and I did a bunch of music there. I recorded an album. I was also in New York and I was mm -hmm. playing music there when they were reopening. Mm -hmm. um, and of course there was that wonderful like four week period where we all thought that this was gonna be over and <laughs> unfortunately it wasn't. And that was wonderful because I was playing everywhere uh, doing all these yeah. great fun shows in New York City. I'm still doing some online shows. Um, I've been trying to do them mostly pre-recorded because yeah. um, it's a little less pressure. It's it's sometimes really hard to do. Um, it's hard to do live shows, um, both with my schedule, which uh, is, is sometimes very mm -hmm. um, intensive. And um, also it's really hard to do live shows um, in general, I find online, and I know some people are really good at it, but like, because I've been alone a lot of the time, I did a lot of that when the pandemic first started and, um, I kind of got a little burnt out. So mostly what I've been doing is doing home recordings and making little videos and, um, and then performing at places that seem appropriate for me to showcase at because, mm -hmm frankly, in this pandemic, what's really come become clear to me is that I don't, I, I really want to pick and choose where I play. And I'm, I don't mean to say that to sound arrogant. I just, I realized for my own self protection that it's not healthy for me to like go out and like try uh -huh. to get every single show, yep. you know, and I used, yeah, I, get that. That I used to do that a lot when I lived in the city. Um, and when I lived in New York, I would go like, sometimes I'd have two or three shows a night and like I'd stack them and it became overwhelming. And, um, so when I was in New York recently, I, I was blessed to perform at uh, Octavia um, Octavia Coner's um, Gender Experts Party. That was really fun. Yeah, it's uh, a great show. Yeah, it's a really fun show. And that was really wonderful for me. Um, and just to do some stuff in Kensington for like, uh, like a porch stomp kind of thing. It's really been weird because um, also because I'm like, I just, you know, I've been able to, in this time, I've kind of shifted my focus from what I was doing, which was a little more punk and rock and roll, mainly because that's not that I'm such a chameleon. It's just that that seemed to me to be the kind of music I was playing at the time, but it also fit in more with where I was. And then I found out um, that there were a whole lot of people who really liked what I was doing as a solo artist a lot more. And and I was like, well, you know what? I really like this too. And maybe I should really focus on that a little more. And that's kind of been where my head's at. I'm like, I want to play my music. I want to play acoustic a lot more. I want to play, if I'm yeah. going to play with a band, I want it to be more of a, like a, an Americana sort of feel and less punky rock and roll because like, sure, I can rock out as with the best of them, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I want it to be a little bit, a little bit different now. I, yeah. I I think I've grown a lot as an artist. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? <laughs> that is, I mean, yeah. And it also like it went it went in other like great directions as well. Uh, and you know, and I've noticed like that's that's not unheard of 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 punk artists. There's a lot of overlap between the two uh, music tastes. Mm -hmm. um you know and there's like a there's a lot of punk uh you know uh artists who went on to have like americana careers yeah. um so like no that's that's not surprising at all to me and like that may that makes a lot of sense um but and i'm, I'm glad you brought up the album because i am gonna ask you to talk about it a little bit mm -hmm. i saw uh, I was on your website a little earlier, and I saw I saw a uh, I saw um, I saw a single from 2021. I don't know when you dropped that, but if you want to talk about uh, the the album and that single on uh, was that a little Mary bit. Dean? That's Mary Dean, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah. So that's that song. It's interesting. I, I do a lot of volunteering with. Um, um, I do a lot of um, I do a lot of volunteering with uh, call it, um, with uh, blah, 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 with an organization called the Homeless Youth Alliance, and um, uh, so it's you know I feed people who are houseless, and uh, at the same time I walk around um, uh, San Francisco a lot, and there's this historical thing. There's this 
woman named Lois Jordan, who during the depression set up a soup kitchen down at the Embarcadero, which is where the piers are. And um, I went and started looking up. I just got this idea for, um, you know, I don't even remember where it came from now, but I just got this idea to just write a, a very traditional folk song about mm -hmm. a person who provides food for the poor and uh, and without judgment based on a lot of the stuff that I'd been experiencing uh, at the houseless shelter that I was working at. Um, and, you know, what's interesting about Mary Dane is it sort of doesn't really fit in with any of my other music. It's very singular. Yeah. Um, which is why I released it as a single. My friend was like, this is an important song. You should release it. And people seem to like it. But what's funny is like, it doesn't really fit in with the stuff that's, that I'm, I mean, if conceptually it fits in a lot, but it's, it's very traditional folk in terms of its layout. The, the album I just made is um, a little more in line with uh, my song Fault Line, which um, uh -huh. I released in 2019. Uh, and in, I think it's like a progression of that where it's like it's sort of in sort of this very upbeat Neil Young, um, uh, Lucinda kind of thing where I'm uh, really just there's a lot of groove in it. And it's like, doom, boom, doom, boom, 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 boom. you know, that kind of groove is happening. I've got really interesting, wonderful Nashville musicians who are really heavy and really good at what, at what they do. And um, in a departure for me, I'm playing almost no lead guitar on the record. I'm pretty much only playing rhythm guitar and singing, which is very cool. Um, I think for a long time, I, I not that I haven't been able to let people take the rein on that, but just that it's been a thing where folks have said to you, people I played, you know, played music with who have played lead guitar in my band, they're like, Mia, you're a pretty damn good guitarist. You don't really need me. And I'm like, well, that's true, but I like you here. So for the last like five or six years, I've mostly been doing my own lead work. So I got in the studio and, and cut a, an album mostly live with my, without any click tracks, okay. with my, with uh, some friends of mine who are mostly queer women um, in Nashville, which is not a thing that usually happens. There's a lot of queer women who sometimes they'll play with other queer women um, uh, and uh, trans folks, but you know, there may be one or two in the band. Whereas in this particular situation, I'm a queer woman, the, en the producer is a queer man um, there's two trans people in the band. There's a queer, uh, woman drummer. There's, you know, and then we had our token straight guy who was playing bass, but that's kind of unheard of in like the Nashville scene that doesn't usually happen, which is a big deal. Um, and then for me, it's a big deal because I don't usually get to have that experience. Most of the time I'm, I'm, I'm recording. I do a lot of the, I play a lot of the parts, or if I've had a band, it's like, friends of mine I've had for years who are mostly men. And um, so that in and of itself is really cool. And then a lot of the stories on, on my record are about, um, I, what's interesting is I wrote a lot of that. About half of the record are songs that I wrote um, after lockdown started. And they're pretty reflective in certain ways and without being like pandemic songs. Um, but they're, because, you know, and a lot of them are just they they have a lot of social commentary but some of them are like stories of of women whose stories have not necessarily historically been uh -huh. represented which is kind of like what i was trying to do with mary dane in that song in particular and uh you know i've got this one song that may be one of the lead singles in which i talk about the fact that if, um one of the things about um people who traditionally did tailoring or who were seamstresses and whatnot a lot of them were folks who had um certain kind of developmental disabilities um and for for a, a lot of them they were folks who couldn't they were folks who couldn't talk a lot of folks who couldn't talk who had who had some sort of maybe cleft palate you know or something like that or they just didn't talk you know for whatever reason or they were traumatized or who the fuck knows what what happened to them a lot of them went into tailoring because they could do their own work they weren't bothered generally, you know, I mean, obviously we all know the stories of like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire and all this other stuff where women were really mistreated. But there were a lot of people who went into the, that particular field because they knew they wouldn't be bothered and they knew that they could shine there. So that is a story I tried to encapsulate, like hidden women's stories in one of these songs. Yeah. And, you know, just go into stuff that is meaningful to me. And then other things 
that my producer, my producer chose the songs out of about 80 or 90 songs that I'd written, um, chose 12 or 13 of them. And, uh, and it was a really cool experience to have somebody else go through my music and just be like, I like this song. I like this song. Oh, uh, this song's really good. I'm like, you like that song? Okay. And then I had to develop it and turn it into something else and, yeah. and make it a better song. And, uh, and I did that this summer before we went into record and it was really cool because I didn't send the band any demos. The, the, my producer was like, I just want you to develop the songs and I want you to get inside them and really know them so that when we go in the studio, we can like just lay them down. I'm like, cool. Do you want me to send the band demos? No. And just show up to the studio cold. I kind of like sketch them out for the band in the room. We like go through it. We were running like two or three songs a day. And like, it was really magical. A lot of these takes were like first take, second takes, like where the band was kind of just learning the song and like a lot of happy accidents, which is a thing that I've, like to do in the past but i've also there's this concept that i've had which is that i don't want to obviously they're my songs and obviously i have creative control but the point is to not have so much control that i'm getting in my own way and i think that's a thing that a lot of artists do is that their their they their music is precious and it's really good but then there's this concept of if you're holding too tightly onto something it's kind of like when you're trying to like squeeze water it just comes out of your hands you know uh -huh. But if you cup water, you can hold it at least for a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, mm -hmm. um, question I ask every week on this. What gives you gender euphoria? Hmm. Um, it's hard to say. Um, I'll be very honest and say that uh, I have never really been able to get over my uh, gender dysphoria. Um, it's It's been a very difficult road for me on that. I'm still working on it really hard. Uh, sometimes what happens, like I have, uh, sometimes occasionally I'll catch like a, a little short video or a picture that somebody else took um, and I'll see myself and I'll be like, who's she? You know, and like yeah. uh, somebody I was with, a, I was with my friend and, uh, and uh, we were hanging out with this little tiny eight week old kitten. And I'm just like, the kitten's like on my face and like biting my face and whatever. And I'm just like, I'd gone out that day and I, you know, I thought I looked okay or whatever. And uh, they took a little video of me while I was holding this cat. And I just looked at it and I was like, oh my God, I look so joyful and I look so happy. And that's really honestly when I feel the most euphoria is when I can get feedback and feel okay looking at myself uh and i know for a lot of cis folks i don't necessarily know if they understand how important it is to like uh -huh. be able to look at yourself and not feel crappy when you're trans uh -huh. um and uh so that's yeah that's yeah. honestly when i feel the best or when people are saying thank you to me after i perform you know when i get feedback that makes me feel good about myself and when i give out to the world uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think I didn't prepare you for this question that mm -hmm. I ask every week, but I think I think you're going to like it. I think you're going to have an answer. Everyone does. Okay. Uh, what cis nonsense are you sick of? I mean... I'm really sick of the, the fact that a lot of um, physicians uh, make trans women promises and, and trans guys too, like, you know, about what they can do for them and, and how a lot of the medical industry, um, I feel like it's so hard for us to talk about it because there's so many people who are anti-trans who are like, oh, the medical system pushes people to be trans and they don't. That's absolutely not true. But the problem is because, and this is true in every facet of the medical industry, because it's because doctors have egos. A lot of doctors think that they're making the right decisions for people, uh, and when they're not, and I feel like, and I feel like there's been a, there has tr classically been this thing where it's like the cis people are the people who are in charge, and and I I see that changing now. Uh, which is really cool. Like 
there's a person staying in my house who's uh, who's trans who's studying to be a doctor. I met an RN the other day who's a trans femme. I met mm -hmm. my new my new physician at my clinic is a trans woman. You know, it's like that's huge. Like to have peer support within the the network of the medical system is huge, and it's not a thing that we have classically and traditionally gotten. And because of that, we've been so kept apart from each other. And when and so that's to me is is the biggest amount of cis bullshit is that there's still this hierarchy of like the cis folks are in charge of our medical shit and they know best and they can feed back to us the things we need and that should not be the case Never. and yeah yeah good answer <laughs> yeah. uh so now we're, we're gonna move on to uh the fun stuff i hope it's all been fun i hope you've enjoyed this this conversation uh but um what is your comfort food comfort music comfort movie comfort food uh is definitely um uh like annie's mac and cheese um usually the shells and cheese with peas and a little cauliflower mixed in and then some like you know cheddar cheese ex extra cheddar cheese on top and that, and then a little bit of pepper that's my comfort food um yeah and it's cool i'm hungry um, now yeah it's good it's good um and then a uh, comfort movie did you say yep comfort movie is uh I used to be Back to the Future, but I find that movie kind of problematic. <laughs> um, like, it's still cool and stuff. I mean, there aren't many movies that I just kind of go back to and go back to and go back to mm -hmm. again anymore, um, mainly because my brain is sort of a repository of so much stuff. Um, let me think here for a second. What is a movie that I just, I absolutely love under all circumstances? Um, oh, Moana. I really love Moana. That is like my comfort movie when I'm like yeah. going blue. That movie just gives it to me real good. Um, and what was the third thing? Uh, comfort music. Comfort music. Um, uh, it's usually something uh, that I can like listen to softly. Um, lately, my comfort uh, music has been Lily Hyatt's album Walking Proof, um, which is really good. Um, there's a song that starts off the second side called Drawl that I'm just really into. And she does that song. It's with Amanda Shires, uh, who's a wonderful artist who is also married to Jason Isbell. Um, so that song in particular has been uh, my go-to song in terms of like how, you know, because it's a song about a person who's um, been trying so hard to fit into the world that they lose a bit of themselves and their friend is giving them feedback. And it's just like, look, I know shit's been hard, but like you're losing the things that make you you. And so then the hook is, you know, I know you've lost your temper. I know you've lost some friends. Don't you ever lose that drawl again? Like this person like went so far outside of who they were that they lost the way they talked, you know? And so that to me, I heard her play it live about a month ago and I was like, it just took me. And then uh, oftentimes the album I put on when I'm just like really like shaken up is a, uh, uh, give up by the postal service well it's the only postal service record but that album is just i didn't find out about that album until about 2010 but like when you know because it was like i think 2003 when it came out something like that and uh now it's like if i'm in a fucked up mood i just stick that one on because it's just like it'll carry me through it's such a an interesting record and there's nothing on it that makes me feel shitty so Mm -hmm. so one thing i like to do on this show is is i ask uh i mean one it, i'm tempted to call them nonsense questions okay but it's it's more just questions we don't get you don't often get asked in an interview and that we don't often get asked as adults okay uh but number one what is your favorite non-musical sound? Uh, I'm just like thinking of a, a donkey, like e I Which, like. By it. the way, it, and uh, something I didn't realize is that Eeyore's name is actually a pun. Mm -hmm. 
because in Britain, uh, RE or, or is, is like ah, so E ah is so like the Britons actually pronounce Eeyore's name E ah. So it's like that's the thing. Eeyore's name is the sound of Donkey Mix. Did not know that until about a month ago. I, I just found out now. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite dinosaur? Right? <laughs> Um, well, what they used to call a brontosaurus, it's not called brontosaurus anymore. Yeah. And, uh, fa favorite animal you can't have as a pet? <laughs> favorite animal? An elephant. All right. So this is, this has been a, a wonderful talk. Um, one you. final question, uh, sure. and then I'll let you plug stuff. Uh, okay. Who are some great trans folks you think are doing great work right now that people should check out? Wow. Um, well, first and foremost, um, uh, Shauna Virago, S-H-A-W-N-A -A Virago. Uh, mm -hmm. She is um, very much like one of the originators of like badass out trans punk Americana. Um, uh -huh. Right now she's yep. doing, a, she's doing an online radio show um, for Lost Church. Um, and um, she's great. Uh, you should check her out. And then um, her partner, Sean Dorsey, who is uh, the first uh, trans um, uh, choreographer um, or out trans choreographer and is mm -hmm. really a badass. Um, and uh, yeah. so, um, and then uh, La Fembert, who's a colleague of mine, uh, uh, and uh, she's just an incredible, wonderful queer trans black woman who um, she uh, produced a song recently for Reba McIntyre, which I was honored to play uh, some guitar on. Um, and so she's one of the, she's the first black trans woman to ever have an, uh, I believe to ever have a track on an album that's in the top 10, which is very cool. Um, and she's really great. Uh, let's see who else, Fury, um, who's a dear friend of mine and you can check them out at soundslikefury.com. They're an incredible mm -hmm. artist um, who's coming into their own as a songwriter. Um, I adore them. Uh, let's see who else, Arya Saeed who is the um, director of the transgender district here in, uh, here in the Bay um, mm -hmm. and is an awesome advocate for uh, transgender work. Uh, I'm just to see who else can I, I mean, you're great. <laughs> Octavia's <laughs> great. Um, yeah, there's just, there's so many people. I mean, I'm, I'm really blessed to, to know how many people are out there. Um, there's a girl named Robin Shakedown, who's in Atlanta, who's a, coming into her own as a really okay. badass uh, rock artist sort of in the tom petty aerosmith yeah. thing like yeah, i don't you know, i don't know this one so i will yeah, I she's will... very cool robin shakedown yeah um she's quite good um there's a woman named gwen forrester who builds guitars in tennessee um and it's dismal axe okay like the word dismal and then the word axe ax um, and uh, I think it's dismalaxe.com, but she's also dismalaxe on Instagram. She builds the most incredible guitars out of local wood that's been felled, um, makes all of her stuff out of like very cool recycled like industrial parts. It's just, she's incredible and is making some of the best guitars out there right now. And they're relatively affordable for what they are. They're custom guitars and you can easily get into them for well under $2,000. So. Uh, you know, if you're looking to spend money on a guitar, I would uh, an, on an electric guitar, an electric bass, I would recommend checking her out because it's like you can't get more artisanal or more local than her. And, you know, she's in the woods in Tennessee making being out as a trans woman and making badass guitars. How cool is that? Yeah. Oh, great answers. <laughs> I get around. Yeah. And it's like. And, and like, I was, re I was like enjoying all your answers. I'm just like, yeah, that's a great person. And then like the last two, I'm just like, oh, I don't know these people. Okay. It's great. Great answers. And I learned something. Glad to help. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one more thing, Mia, please, uh, let people know where they can find you on the internet. Uh, what you have going on. Um, 
Yeah, yeah I mean, the if you're if you're looking to listen to my music, the easiest thing to do is drop my name into Google, and it'll come up. Um, uh, whatever streaming service you use, obviously, you can buy my songs on Bandcamp. I have a Patreon, which is the thing I push the most because that is a really. I'm just. Tr I really need to get that more off the ground. Um, I post new songs to it every week um, for subscribers. I, I write new songs every week. So I'm, I'm always posting new songs there just for subscribers. And um, yeah, I uh, that pays some of my bills and I'm trying to get completely independent right now. Um, but that's a really good way to sort of, sort of like get in my head if, if you're interested in what I do, because I'm pretty honest and I write an essay every week about that. Um, there's yeah, I mean, just please, uh, you know, uh, my, it's just if you just type my name into like Instagram, into Twitter, I will come up and I'm easy to find. And uh, I'm pretty lucky that, that happened that there aren't any other Mia Burns with my spelling, although somebody grabbed my freaking username on Twitter. So whatever. Um, but yeah, that's just that's I, I'm constantly doing stuff and trying to keep up with myself. Um, and uh, that's the easiest way to find me is just to put my name into your googs and figure out what works for you in terms of getting in touch yeah <clears throat> okay well mia thank you so much and thank you everybody for watching we will be back next week with another great interview with one of our trans faves mm -hmm. uh and also next week uh we are trans has a great music and poetry show at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. That is Between the Lines. Uh, I reached out to book you. You weren't available. Uh, but the people who are are fantastic. Uh, it is hosted by myself and the wonderful Parker. Uh, and uh, we, we have some great folks on that. Hopefully you can make it. Uh, and... Uh, until next time, take care of yourselves. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.